Welcome to day two at the Global Market Theatres. Uh, today is sponsored by Siemens Gamesia at Renewable Energy. My name's Stuart Mullen. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Wind Energy Council. So on behalf of GWIC and Siemens Gamesia, welcome all of you today. And uh, this session is also being recorded online. So for those of you watching at home, welcome very much. Today we're having a CEO panel uh, to discuss offshore wind in Asia. And so in the, last, in the latest Global Wind report, GWIC predicts that the Asia is set to, install, uh, set to overtake Europe as having the largest volume of installed offshore wind turbines for the first time in 2022. The bulk of the volume comes from China. Other markets in Asia are starting to emerge as well. And floating offshore wind and hydrogen creation will also unlock even more volume as these technologies start to mature. On this panel today, we have a panel, uh, a range of CEOs from industry and uh, other leaders. But to start the session off, I'd like to play a video welcome from uh, the CEO of Siemens Gamesia. I think that video is ready to go now. ...is the answer to two of the most pressing questions of our time. One, how do we provide a secure and affordable energy supply for our society? And two, how can we generate enough clean energy to prevent the climate crisis? The technology for change is here. Our latest generation of offshore wind turbines, for example, has an output of up to 15 megawatts. And each wind turbine generates enough energy for 18,000 households. As a leader in offshore wind technology, we build wind turbines with outputs in the gigawatt range. In each of our wind power plants, more than 100 of those wind turbines generate clean electricity at sea. The wind industry is of strategic importance in the energy transformation. Now is the time for us to make a joint decision to support the rapid expansion of wind energy, together with governments and investors, together with project developers and the public. Let's keep the wind industry as a strong economic sector in the long term, in Europe and also worldwide. Yes, th thanks very much for that scene setting. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Christian Bender, who is the commercial head office, offshore platform and portfolio, uh, head of, sorry, head of offshore platform and portfolio management at SGRE. Christian, welcome to the stage. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm standing in for, as you can see, I'm not, uh, first surprise, I'm not Mark Becker. So, um, but I'm standing in for him. Mark, unfortunately, has co contracted COVID, so uh, he cannot be here. But he's doing okay. Just. Um, so let me give you some thoughts of, of Siemens Gamesa on the Asia-Pacific region. And I'll start with a little bit about ourselves. You can see some data. Um, we see ourselves as the market leader in offshore. We have, uh, in the meantime, 20 gigawatt installed. We have more than 6,000 employees. We've got an order book that's more than 10 billion. And we have a revenue of about 3 billion. And that's the status as of June. And we hope that that will continue to grow over time. When it comes to APEC, I think you mentioned it already, um, we see a significant growth. If you look on the left side of the chart, you will see that the Growth so far has been moderate. It's been at around 8.4. Um, but we do see that kicking off after 26 at more than 20% CAGR, which is faster than the rest of the market. So that's why this market is growing stronger than the rest of the offshore market. Really impressive. Um, what we also see is the distribution of that as uh, taken from the GWAC report. Uh, you'll see the countries leading led by Taiwan. Um, with 14, you'll see South Korea uh, catching up uh, at more than seven. Japan is a big market at around six. And Vietnam is equally uh, in that range. And India is a little bit smaller uh, for the meantime. But of course, this is only until 2031. So that can, of course, change over time. Um, what I wanted to say on this market is the takeaway line at the bottom of the slide. Any local content that we have to manufacture will have to be um, competitive so that we can also export within the region or even in globally. 
um, because we will not be able to afford investments into that region if it's only loca located to one country itself. No? When we look at the Asia-Pacific region and we look at the challenges and the opportunities we have, we have four challenges and four opportunities. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing a tendency towards this country-specific um, or country-centric local content approach, which I just mentioned. Um, we're sometimes seeing not so mature regulations and scoring systems, which lead to uncertainties for us, but also for the developers, of course. Um, we see uh, sometimes an issue finding suitable vessels um, and some hindrance in the local regulations. This is not specific to the Asian market. We also see that in the US, for example. Um, and then we see a tendency towards smaller project sizes, which, as many of you know, is not helping to get to scale effects and cost competitiveness. Now, what we think where the opportunity actually lies in APEC is to leverage these cross-regional, uh, let's call them clusters. Uh, for example, we have a very strong cluster in Korea on foundations, shipyards, for example. Uh, we have a good tower manufacturing capability in Vietnam. So this is strength in the Asian region that we maybe do not see in other regions in the world. So that's a, a unique opportunity. We do see some government schemes which are extremely attractive um, and supportive. So we would like to build on that some more. Um, the market will force us to develop innovative approaches because of the uh, logistics constraints I just mentioned. So maybe if we do that, we can also leverage them elsewhere. So that's interesting. I'll come back to floating later on. Uh, for example, installing the complete turbine in the harbor and just towing it out could be one of these concepts. Um, and then finally, we have some very good wind resources and some strong con uh, long coastlines in the region, which makes it attractive. Now, looking at what we have done uh, so far as uh, Siemens Gamesa and two markets, uh, and that we'd like to pick out here Taiwan and Korea, um, Taiwan actually is a, a market where we are very proud that we have actually built a real nacelle assembly facility. Um, and that has been now uh, is being uh, uh, made fit to produce our newest turbine generation, uh, the 14 megawatt, 222. So that's something that we are very, very proud of. We're also training our technicians uh, on the ground. The technicians have been very, very brave during the COVID times. They've had shifts of three weeks on the ground uh, after going through quarantine for a couple of weeks, separated from their family. So this has been a tough time for them, but uh, we're very proud of what we have done so far. Um, and if you look to the right-hand side, you will see that um, we actually have a, 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 you may have seen it in the press, a very innovative uh, approach in Korea where we are working with uh, uh, Doosan um, to, to come to a cooperation. We've signed a memorandum of understanding that we were looking into all parts of the value chain together with Doosan in Korea. So I'm looking forward to that. Actually, the team is on the ground in Korea right now discussing these topics. So as I said in the beginning, Taiwan remains the front runner, and Korea is catching up fast. fast. Mm -hmm. If we look at floating, um, floating is the technology is ready for floating. The challenge we see is that it is not yet at an industrial scale. Um, so we do see a need to mature the, the floating technology and also the installation and everything around floating. Um, what is, I mean, this is something that is true not only for APAC but for the globe in general. So that's um, not specific. However, I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, there is something in APAC that makes APAC special for floating. The, so what we would need is we would need foundations with scalability and industrialization potential, as I said. We would need um, concepts to assemble these large structures uh, and install them with a high frequency output. Um, they would typically come from shipyards. We would probably get not too many a week out of that, and we would have to work on that a little more to get more out, of, out per week. Especially if we look at the right-hand side, uh, if you look at the sizes of the projects, for example, in Korea, um, you can see that these have increased significantly uh, compared to where we came from. Uh, you might recall Siemens Gamesa did a first floating project in Norway called Highwood Tumpen. That's a 2.3 gigawatt machine. That was 2009. If you look at these sizes here, 1.3 gigawatt capacity, 2.6 gigawatt at the top, that's quite amazing. Uh, and that is also 
something where the Korean market is leading worldwide. What is also special about Korea is that they have the shipyard building capabilities, which means they can actually manufacture these very complex foundations. Uh, and that gives, gives that market a unique opportunity to be uh, leading the uh, floating development. So I think um, last point is we need uh, visibility of the pipeline and uh, to be able to explore these commercial opportunities triggering this industrialization and uh, yeah, de-risking the whole concept. So with that, how am I doing on time? I think that was my, it's fine, good. But then I would like to thank you very much. Th thank you for that uh, introduction, Christian. And Christian will be joining the panel in about five minutes time when we, uh, invite other panelists, other CEOs and leaders to join the st on stage here. Interesting that you also talked about floating offshore wind. If people are interested in floating offshore wind, at four o'clock tomorrow there's going to be a session dedicated to floating offshore wind. And at three o'clock on Friday, we're going to have a session on uh, supply chain and the sustainability aspects. So if you're interested in a deeper dive into those topics, please make sure you get along here. Our next speaker today is Mr. Nick Iguchi. From, uh, he's a partner and co-head of renewable energy at Baker McKenzie Tokyo. Welcome, Nick. Please make him welcome. Uh, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Nick Eguchi. Uh, partner of Baker McKenzie Tokyo uh, office. I'm uh, honored to speak in Hamburg. Uh, yesterday, uh, Matthias uh, started with uh, Beatles. Um, so I'd like to start with um, someone else. Um, do you know a famous actor in the movie of Mission Impossible? Do you know? Tom Cruise, yes. Um, do you know how old is he? No, 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 no. He is uh, 60 years old. Do you know how old Nick is? <laughs> Sixty, sixty. So, uh, all you have to remember today is Nick is same age as Tom, <laughs> and mission is possible. Okay, and now let's start um, the, my presentation. Um, my uh, Baker McKenzie has an uh, office uh, in uh, all over uh, Asia. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my colleagues uh, kindly uh, prepared Yeah, uh, so uh, Baker McKenzie uh, Asian colleagues uh, prepared one page slide of uh, each country. And uh, uh, I order, the order of the slide is uh, from um, uh, developed uh, country uh, to the early stage countries. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, the development of those countries. Um, my main, uh, presentation is only 10 minutes uh, on the speed tour in Asia. So if you have any questions uh, later, uh, please send me an email. Uh, the, my email address is the uh, last page of this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure uh, you will get uh, my slide uh, at a later stage. So you don't need to take a picture of the slide. Of course, you can take a picture of me, <laughs> so free. So let's start with the, uh, the most uh, advanced country. Um, it's a China. Uh, it's a PRC, uh, Re uh, People Republic of China. As you can see from the uh, top line, uh, uh, they are reached uh, to 20 
uh, gigawatt. So clearly, uh, they are the number one market. But uh, uh, it's difficult for uh, overseas uh, investors to penetrate into a Chinese market. I, I did a research and uh, only I found EDF uh, projects. I couldn't find the, uh, any other project of the international players uh, penetrate into the Chinese market. So uh, it's a big market, but uh, we need to see uh, how to uh, penetrate into a PRC market. Next is uh, Taiwan. Uh, as you have heard, uh, the Taiwan is a big market. And uh, the Siemens Gamesa uh, opened up uh, factories. It's a great news. So clearly, uh, they are uh, developing very quickly. At the moment, they only have uh, 237 megawatt in operation. Uh, but uh, uh, already, 5.5 gigawatt is uh, uh, awarded. And also, uh, at the moment, round three uh, auction is going on. So it's a great market to invest. Uh, now move on to uh, Japan, uh, which is uh, my home country. And uh, thanks to uh, Mathias uh, of BP, uh, he advised Japanese company a lot. And uh, we finally uh, closed uh, round one auction uh, last uh, Christmas Day, um, the Mitsubishi Corporation won the three sites, 1.7 gigawatt uh, in total. So it's amazing. Uh, I, I advised uh, another bidder, but uh, our client unfortunately lost the bid uh, because the Mitsubishi Corporation's price was the same level of the European price and uh, uh, Taiwan price. Com uh, taking into account of the lower uh, wind speed in, in Japan. So it's a very competitive market from the round one. And we'll have a round two and round three combined from this December. Uh, so it's about 1.6 gigawatt size again. So uh, uh, please uh, visit Japan. And uh, Japan will open up uh, the travel restriction next month. So you do not need any more um, PCR test and uh, any uh, certification. So you can fr freely come to Japan from next month. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, Republic of Korea. Uh, as uh, as um, explained before, uh, the Korea is also uh, uh, the big market. Uh, they are growing uh, very uh, rapidly. So it's a good competition between Japan, Jap uh, Korea, and Taiwan, and the competition and the cooperation. So you will see a big jump of the Korean market. And Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is an up-and-coming market. Um, at the moment, it's a zero uh, 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 in installation, uh, but uh, and they have a big plan. Uh, 7 gigawatt by 2030 and uh, uh, 64.5 gigawatt by 2045. Uh, 45. But the issue is, is a credit risk of the uh, national uh, off-taker, EVN. So we definitely need uh, uh, credit agency support such as Asian uh, Development Bank or, or European uh, uh, Export Credit Agency to support the off-takers uh, off credit risk or uh, uh, Vietnam central government uh, credit support to the uh, EVN uh, credit risk. Uh, but if we have that kind of a system, then uh, it's a big market uh, in Vietnam. And Australia, as you know, Australia is a big country and they have uh, lots of onshore wind, but now they are thinking about uh, offshore wind as well. And uh, they have a draft plan and uh, uh, they will uh, in introduce 2 gigawatt uh, by uh, 28 and uh, 8 gigawatt by uh, 28 and onwards. So uh, it, it will be an uh, uh, up and coming uh, market. And uh, we have a slide of the uh, Thailand, Philippines. Uh, 
and uh, Indonesia and Malaysia and uh, uh, Singapore. Um, but the, those countries are early stage of the offshore wind um, project, so uh, we need to watch, but uh, it's a, a very early stage at the moment. Uh, I have some uh, slides of the Japanese market, but uh, uh, I'll skip. Um, so uh, that's all my presentation. And if you have uh, any questions, please send me an email uh, to this address. Thank you very much. And mission is possible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Top, uh, Mick. Nick, uh, it's great. To say. <laughs> Glad it's Mission Impossible and not risky business. Um, we are moving into the panel session now, and so I'd like to welcome to the stage. Oh, actually, before I introduce Amisha, who's going to run the panel session, I need to say that uh, Nick's slides. For anyone that would like to see Nick's slides, you can uh, download them from the Global Wind Energy Council website. So at gwic.net, you can find Nick's presentation from today. Uh, you can also see his present. You can actually see Nick's presentation and him delivering it on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, but I'd like to invite to the stage now the global head of policy and public affairs at Mainstream Renewables, Amisha Patel. Welcome, Amisha. Thank you very much. Can can everyone hear me? Oh, brilliant! That's a lot of thumbs up. Well, hello and welcome to you all, and thank you for you all to you all for being here and. Um, making the morning rush. You, you clearly beat the crowds. Um, thank you, Stuart, for the warm welcome and for the GWEC te to the GWEC team for this opportunity. Now, Nick, I think we all loved your analogy about mission impossible and the mission truly being possible. And the spotlight this morning is how we get things going in Asia. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our panelists. First of all, Christian Bender, commercial head of offshore pl platform and portfolio management at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Welcome back. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> Next, we have Eloise Burnett, Senior Asia Manager at Carbon Trust. Welcome, Eloise. <laughs> Danielle Yarsky, Chief Development Officer Offshore Wind at RWE. Please join us. Marty Sintha, Sintha Van Narog, Head of International Business at Gulf Energy Development. Welcome, Marty. <laughs> and last but not least, Arkim Berger Olsen, CEO at Skyborne Renewables. Please join us. Welcome, Akeem. <laughs> nice well, <laughs> good morning to you all. Thank you for being Hi. here. Hi. So first of all, we have tasked our panelists this morning to <laughs> put together three to four minutes worth of remarks explaining to us why the spotlight is on Asia. I'd like you to tell us a bit about your organization, a bit about what you're doing in Asia, and some of the opportunities and challenges that you foresee and perhaps signal to one or two markets where you see a lot of promise. So, who am I going to go to first? Akeem, Skyborn Renewables, recently born. So, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, well, I'm representing Skyborn Renewables, which is not a new player. It's uh, the new name of WPD Offshore. Uh, which was require, uh, acquired by, by GIP in May, and the closing was just two weeks ago. And Skyborne Renewables is our new name. Uh, I got often the question, why did you choose the name Skyborne? Well, the easy answer is because we deal with Skyborne Renewables. That's what we do. It's, it's all coming out of the sky, and, and that's where the name comes from. Uh, well, our portfolio in Asia, uh, I think, is known. We have a big presence in Taiwan with one project uh, under construction, uh, another one uh, awarded, and obviously we will participate in the upcoming tenders. And then we have a presence in Korea, Japan, Australia, India, 
and uh, developments in Vietnam, Indonesia and Malaysia. And I hope I haven't forgotten anything, but um, that's what we do. So we had a focus on the Asian region. Question why? We think obviously because of the growth perspective. Uh, we believe in offshore wind. We are true believers. We believe that every single country on this planet will discover that resource if they have the access. So um, if they have access to, to bigger uh, coastlines and open water, they will finally uh, employ the, the offshore wind resource. And it's just a question of time and obviously also a question of the alternatives around other energy sources. But finally, they will, will um, do offshore wind. And then for us, it's just a question, OK, which country will do it before the others? and what are the circumstances, and then we just do a ranking, like I guess everybody else. Uh, we need to prioritize, we need to focus. I think we did a good job in choosing Taiwan as our first and main focus in the early years. The reason was that we uh, developed onshore projects for about 15 years in Taiwan, and about half of the onshore capacity in um, uh, in Taiwan was uh, developed by us and uh, yeah well nowadays by WPD but still this is the history and and then it was an easy jump for us into the offshore uh, part and, and uh, if I na name a second market I will also say Korea probably as the next one coming up but I think I had only three minutes so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Eloise let's go to you next. Yeah, thanks. So I'm Eloise Bennett. I'm Senior Asia Manager at the Carbon Trust. Um, I'm coming from Asia from a slightly different perspective from the rest of my panelists. So Carbon Trust is a mission-driven organization that is focused on supporting both public and private sector moving to net zero in any way, really. And our interest in offshore wind in Asia is twofold. We do a lot of advisory working on creating and shaping regulation and policies, trying to support governments to understand the issue and create frameworks for the build out of offshore wind. We also work on collaboration platforms called joint industry programs where we bring together industry, government and other supply chain players to create and develop advisory, research, R&D, whatever we see are gonna be um, projects that are going to accelerate the build out of offshore wind or reduce barriers that we see. Our most recent activity has actually been in the Philippines, so um, we have recently set up the Philippines Offshore Wind Joint Industry Program, which is an incredibly exciting initiative. We have 17 developers and supply chain players working with the Department of Energy and sitting in a room coming together saying, you've done this elsewhere, what does the Philippines need to do? And with, for us, I think the Philippines is an exciting, exciting place to be with a change of government, with a real, real drive from the central, central um, central ag agencies that, wanted, that, that are in, in charge of, of offshore wind. So yeah, I'm um, really excited about the Philippines. But of course, I think the two things that I see is personnel. I mean, we see, we see the graphs, we see the numbers. And um, you've got to attract the talent that's going to build out the offshore wind to, to meet those stats, to allow that to happen. And it's got to happen at speed. I mean, I don't know if anyone else has read the ASEAN Energy Outlook um, released last, last week. It is, does not make very optimistic reading. Um, the, the progress in the last five years has not been great. And so if we are projecting those, those same speeds out, then we will just not, not meet what we need to do. So um, I think it's about building that personnel and, and building capacity in the countries as early as possible. And hopefully we're, we're doing our bit to try and, try and do that. Thank you very much, Eloise. Danielle, coming to you next. Thanks, Amisha. And um, first of all, also to um, stay here interactive and, and very fondness of, of Nick, who I much appreciate. I also thought about uh, an analogy for today. And yesterday we had the Beatles today. It apparently is a movie, so I will pick this up. And I, I guess we will come in our discussion later on um, to that as well. But um, when I prepared for uh, the panel, in particular with the focus on the Asia Pacific, um, which has huge potential and is on the rise, I thought about Groundhog Day. 
and why did I do that? Um, for two major reasons, and I guess all the panelists and I will chip in later, because it's for us as an industry and also for the governments out there in Asia, the question, will there be more weeks of winter or will spring come and finally renewables and in particular offshore wind will kick in? Um, and uh, become big and um, be the potential as it's um, theoretically possible. And the second uh, dimension of this analogy of Groundhog Day, we are a mature industry, so we learned many lessons already. We shouldn't do the same mistakes in Asia again. Um, we should be aware and clear about which kind of mechanism, which market design works well. I think this year's energy crisis also as a test quite some of the regulatory schemes. Uh, we've seen um, spikes in energy prices, etc. Um, so we, we, we learned our lessons in market design, in supply chain, in the regulatory framework, in the efficient uh, deployment um, of offshore wind, um, as a business developer, so uh, that's the second one, I, and I'm pretty sure we will tap on both dimensions as we go on. Um, so keep that in mind, um, and uh, we get back to that. Um, for my side, Daniel Jaske, as you said, I'm representing here um, the developers, so um, RWE is um, the, one of the largest offshore wind players in the world. We have a, a long-standing history of over 120 years, and we've been in the offshore business successfully for the last 20 years, so quite uh, from the early start, and had some groundhog days, I must admit, so, um, so to say. Um, looking at Asia in particular, and uh, we leave Australia aside, as I learned there will be a dedicated session later on, I think um, the potential is huge. If you look at the international energy agencies' um, numbers, but also the global wind energy um, council numbers, theoretically it's beyond the hundreds of gigawatts. And we really need to think what this means. We have a society of electrification. We have the climate crisis ongoing. So the, 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 the foundation is there. And um, yeah, there are some auctions upcoming um, in Japan, um, the next round. So let's see uh, what the results will be there. I think Korea, uh, South Korea now needs to really find its way in, in defining, having a call from the top that renewable uh, energy sources is part of the energy mix going forward, and then set the framework um, for the industry to um, uh, develop and uh, build those um, uh, offshore wind firms. And of course, the many other markets you mentioned, um, I can only echo, and very happy to be here today. Thanks, Amisha. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sensing a lot of themes emerging here, so we'll, <laughs> we'll come on to those. But Marty, can I, can I hand the stage to you? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Marty from Golf Energy Development. Uh, we are a Thai energy developer. Uh, total uh, generation about four, 14 gigawatts uh, in, in worldwide. So uh, thank you for having me up here. I think that uh, Asia is a very exciting market uh, we are very present. We have development in Vietnam, currently 120 megawatts that's uh, being developed over there. And of course, as Nick mentioned and, and my fellow panelists mentioned, uh, the market is huge. You know, in Japan, in South Korea, uh, we're exploring the Philippines and Indonesia. So it, it's good that uh, we're on stage here to discuss this topic and this market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christian. Yes, well, I, I gave some, some, some words at the beginning of the session, so uh, let me, I forgot to actually say what I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for all investments in offshore, and that's also why I'm, uh, the factories in APEC are dear to my heart, because uh, they are very high investments, I can tell you. Um, so maybe picking up some of the things you said, um, which markets are we, are we active in? I already mentioned Taiwan is probably the, the key market for us. We are also active in, in Japan as well. Uh, we are active in Korea, uh, as you've seen from this memorandum of understanding. Um, and we're a little bit special because you mentioned there's no European developers in China, but we do have a licensed partner in China. So we do do business through Shanghai Electric in China as a manufacturer, which means we are also actually active in China through the licensed partner. Um, when it comes to 
Groundhog Day, actually. Uh, that was actually very nice. I thought about Taiwan because I remember I was in headquarters approving projects uh, back then. And then the, the Taiwanese team came and wanted approvals for the project. It was 2016 or something. I said, it's never going to happen, guys. Yeah? Never going to happen. Forget it. You've been coming the last five years. Yeah? This will never pick up. And actually, I was proven wrong. Uh, so that was very nice to see, I have to say. Um, and that means, at least for Taiwan, that Groundhog Day has been overcome, I would say. And they are now on a very, very nice growth, growth curve. So that's just something I wanted to, to mention from the past. Uh, you were part of that process, Achim. Yeah, so. Um, when it comes to what's really important for us, for us, I think uh, the key is to have this region develop across countries, as I said. So if we, have a, if we do this investment and have a factory in one region, we really need to be able to leverage that across the other parts of the region, or maybe even globally, ideally. So that's what's important to us in the future development of APEC. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. I, I can see quite a lot of nods in the audience, and we will be opening up the floor for questions shortly. But I, I do, I do want to pick up on a few points with the panelists, and really sticking um, to the point that you've just raised about regional cooperation. And this is this is coming up quite a lot in the sector globally. We've seen so many talks across the North Sea, across Europe as well, and how we strengthen this, and how this has an impact on strengthening um, cooperation amongst the supply chain as well. So I'd like the panel's views on regional cooperation in Asia. Mm -hmm. What are the early indicators? What are the, some of the challenges? And are there any lessons that can be applied from Europe or elsewhere to Asia? And Eloise, I'll come to you first and then Akeem, and then we'll work through the panel. Yeah, thanks, Misha. So we actually did a study, a year-long study on this exact question um, in 20, 2021. Um, we were tasked, uh, we actually did this work with GWEC on, OK, we have models of cooperation and collaboration in the US, in the North Sea. They've been around for 10, 12 years. Can we replicate this? Can we look at uh, maybe the five, six leading geographies for offshore wind and see if there's a, a model um, that would work. <coughs> I, I, I hate to say it, but the answer was no, not yet. And it's something that's what you've already brought up. It's the introspective. It's the, it's the looking after your own house first before turning around and looking outwards. And it, it is a huge, huge missed opportunity. And it's something that I think we've got, as an industry, got to speak, use, our, use our roles as kind of cross-geography to make sure that we're bringing other geographies in, into those conversations, into those meetings, and saying, like, have you spoken to it? And I think who, those who were here yesterday and were around the global, the, the World Bank delegations, they had a day where they just literally spoke to each other as emerging markets. And I spoke to the people from Azerbaijan <laughs> and Romania and, and um, the Vietnamese and Philippines delegations, and they found it incredibly useful. So I think it's just chiseling away at that, at that my, my area is my end of my uh, country, country boundaries and trying to encourage it. Um, but yeah, we will continue to keep trying. <laughs> Akeem? Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, they, they have to talk to each other for sure, and we maybe need to make them talk. So yeah. GWAC and others have really an important function mm. here. There are obviously historical connections, you know, which are important. I mean, for example, between Taiwan and Japan, there's a good uh, connection regarding the industry, and, and this can be used, but uh, we need to, to push them a bit. Otherwise, the industry will find their own ways. I think Korea and, and maybe also Vietnam and Singapore, they made good business now with the Taiwanese offshore wind supply chain and, and their, their problems um, in the end. But it's a very, still a very nationalistic view, and, and this is not really uh, positive for the entire industry. So we need to, to help them, and maybe we also need to look uh, to ourselves about the, um, the, short, uh, the shortage in the supply chain, which is partly made by us uh, and, and the, the projects being very close to each other. So we now see, you have mentioned that in your presentation, uh, the, the different vessels, uh, and, and they're booked, obviously, chartered by different parties. And if there is a small delay in one project, you have delay in four yeah. other projects. Oh, yeah. Because we are all tied to each other, and we tend to sit on our asset and say, well, I've booked my period here, and I will not give you anything because I am really afraid if I give it to you, I am not getting it back. So that's what we see now in Taiwan, where, where we have the assets and blocking uh, each other. 
this need to be overcome and somebody has to moderate that, uh, somebody who's, not, who's neutral, who's, who's not tied into a project, mm. uh, that could help as well. And, and just building on that, Daniel, you mentioned policy interventions. Can you elaborate and talk a bit about that and how that can be helpful? Yeah. I mean, Isha, it's um, really um, getting the basics right. So I think it, uh, first and foremost, needs to have a clear framework and call from the government, a commitment of renewable energy sources in the energy mix, a clear path um, for offshore and other renewables energy sources. And then there needs to be, because that trickles down in the end. In the end, there is a, a local authority who needs to decide. There is um, a local stakeholders, local community who needs to understand, who needs to be part of the project development, um, who also uh, needs to and should benefit um, from uh, also the economic development here. So this is, this is the first. Then. Secondly, it's really getting the basics right. So having not only the, the, the uh, call for renewables and offshore wind in the energy mix, but also an understanding what is the impact on grid infrastructures, transmission, um, having their holistic plan going forward, um, um, and also engaging with those um, authorities um, with the TSOs, uh, the ISOs, uh, et cetera, with the Jenkos, etc., and say um, this is part of our um, um, strategic um, energy plan, and, and it needs to be um, also then um, coming there together. Um, and then, of course, the market design as such um, is important because we are talking here multi-billion investments in the supply chain. Um, with the developers, also benefiting local communities. So it needs to be clear when you make the investment decision um, what, what you're signing up for. And there um, are more market design um, frameworks which are more stable than others, which in particular in the asset test of this year's energy crisis have, um, 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 yeah, not been beneficial, and if it's the least um, uh, beneficial, of course, if it hits through fully on the consumer prices, I think this is no, nothing um, we all want um, overall um, to see and, and get the renewables employment uh, stalled on that. So this is really key classical pillars uh, which need to be in place um, to drive this forward. Did you want to come in, Marty? Yes, <clears throat> I'd like to, to reiterate that. Yeah. With the, the current energy crisis right now, it, it's key that the stakeholders need to come together and, and just sit and talk because it can't just be the developers talking to the government or the government just talking to the communities. Uh, everybody has to come together to, to speed things up because time is of the essence, as we can see. We, we don't want to um, delay any development and developers know what needs to get done and can help the government uh, shape the policy, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes we understand that the government may not know uh, every key element into developing onshore wind, offshore wind. Um, we're, we're here to help and we'd love to, to work with everyone and also with the local communities. You know, sometimes um, we want to get them involved and we want to help them <coughs> or, you know, job creation as, as local supply chain, for example. Just, just staying with the policy theme just for, just for a little bit longer. We've seen, again, sort of advancements in Europe where we're looking at sort of um, auctions and looking at non-price criteria coming into auctions. We've, we're looking, you've all outlined and, and, and sort of signposted very different range of markets within Asia from Thailand, Philippines to Vietnam to Taiwan all on very different journeys, the same one, but in very different um, advancements in terms of their policy mechanisms. Can I just get a bit of an, an insight from our panelists as to where, which particular markets in the region do you think are heading in the right direction? Bearing in mind we've got a broad audience listening, so you're, you're, this is a perfect opportunity to <laughs> hit some messages um, home, if you like. And any, any sort of areas that you think need particular focus? Um, Eloise, you're nodding. Can I come to you first? Yeah, I have. <laughs> I think the one that needs particular focus builds upon what you've just said about um, the pricing that's coming through in Europe and the want and desire and the optimistic ambition that 
that market's going to leapfrog straight through to those very low prices. And I think this is something we're seeing a reluctance from governments to really commit to what we know is needed in early stage markets, which is the incentives. It's the, it's the expectation that prices are going to be high. I think in particular in India, our work in India, we're seeing a really sluggish appreciation that that cost parity is not going to happen straight away. Um, and that's the zero, zero uh, price contracts aren't going to be the ones that come through their door straight away. And it's, it's frustrating because we, we know that that's going to um, damage damage the market eventually because it was just a bit of bad press at the beginning from all the stakeholders that are involved. So it's, it's, it's a frustration for us to, to, to see that um, assumption coming through. I, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Anyone else? <laughs> Marty? Well, uh, you know, as far as policy goes, mm. I guess the, the only comment that I can share with our experience is, you know, we, we don't want to burden uh, any party with, with shaping policy. Uh, we would be glad to, to help comment, to help uh, uh, explore, to, to get data. Uh, you know, we're we're the, the experts, we're developers, and we'd be happy to work with, with any government that you know, we're exploring opportunities in, in that country. Yeah, can only echo um, uh, that as well. And there are lessons learned and, and also um, mirroring that with the potential in Asia. Just picking one example, um, uh, in Japan, the, the average size of an offshore wind farm is still um, below 400 megawatt. In Europe, this is considered a very small size already, meaning the scalability and the efficiency on the, on the industry isn't applied yet, which then effectively also will have an impact on the offtake and the prices. Um, so these are, this is one example of many um, where we tapped already into where I think the lessons learned um, will pro uh, prevent us from another Groundhog Day. Um, and the um, willingness and the ability of the industry is there. We are ready. Thank you. Akim, sure. Yeah, well, I think for new markets which are not developed yet, there's only one uh, system which really has turned out to be very successful, and this is a fixed in feed and tariff. That's it. Uh, you know, why is all the industry in Taiwan? You know, not because of the nice uh, price tenders now, but because we had these huge feeling tariff in the beginning. You know, that was the, the honey, and then everybody was uh, attached to that one. And, and uh, yeah, they, they tricked us into that, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> and, and I think that's a smart idea to, to have a first round, really attractive, high prices, you know, and then they are in, they have established their organization, and then from a politician <laughs> point of view, you have to get the price down, and then we have to figure out what to do. Uh, I think that's a very smart, smart idea, and if it's not a developed market, I'm a big fan of easy, um, uh, simple uh, conditions, so we do not need any tariff anymore. We, we can definitely work with CPPAs, uh, we are very well developed, we don't need that support, we need some order how to get the grid connection and how to do the localization of the sites. That's it, otherwise we don't need any more help. Mm. Christian, did you want to come in? No, just, just to pick up on what you said, I think we need a certain project size. I fully agree to what all of you said. Um, I think we need uh, transparent and clear rules, as you mentioned, uh, looking outside of the own country for things to steal from other systems would be nice and acknowledge that there is a supply chain outside of your own country that's quite competitive. That's for me the key, what I would recommend. Now, Christian, now that you've mentioned um, project size and you, you know that I've been burning to ask you this question, um, it's pretty impressive how offshore turbines have evolved in the last 30 years. Hmm. Where do you think we'll be in 30 years from now? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, that's hard to say. Yeah? Um, I, I think if we look back in time, maybe that gives us the indication. I think 30 years ago, we had a project in Denmark called Winnebu uh, that was actually from, uh, from our predecessor company, Bonus. Um, and that was uh, 450 kilowatt turbines with 13 one three meter blades. Um, and now we have the 14 megawatt 236 rotor today, 
30 years later, and I'm pretty sure nobody would have guessed that that would come if you had asked anybody. And I have some quotes actually from not so long ago where people said that we will never be able to manufacture anything like that. So the technology is progressing. Uh, I'm not sure where it will head. Um, but one thing is for sure, we will not, um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to lose track of what the infrastructure is doing out there. So that means when it comes to foundations, we have to be very careful when it comes to installation vessels, when it comes to harbors, um, when it comes to manufacturing facilities. What we don't want to do is, let me put it this way, build the next you know, A380 or so. No, that doesn't make sense. So where it will end, I don't know, but I'm sure technology will progress. Yep, and it's mission possible, right? It is mission so, possible, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to pause here for a moment and just scan the audience. If you've got any questions for our panelists, can you raise your hand and try and catch my eye? OK, the gentleman at the back, and we have a roaming mic. If you could just state your name and your affiliation, that would be greatly appreciated. <coughs> my name is Manuel Zea. I'm from Formosan Business Support, based in Taiwan. And uh, I founded my company at the beginning to develop the local supply chain in Taiwan. But uh, due to low demand on the local side, it's much more focused to do know-how transfer from Europe to Taiwan. And uh, my, my question is, um, is a private company like Siemens Gamesa, or we have seen recently in the Union Project, there are a lot of challenges. And uh, as a private company, how you want to change the mindset of the Taiwan government? Like in the Siemens Gamesa uh, assembly line in Taichung, um, there's only one road going to the port. Mm -hmm. And if you want to expand, you have to bring the workers from the city 50 minutes by car. And uh, I, I, I don't see enough commitment from the Taiwan government to support the companies who are building the industry to give the infrastructure and the loans necessary to build the supply chain. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I had a little tr difficulty at the beginning to understand, but your, your question is basically how do we as a private company interact with, let's say, the powerful governments uh, in the country and try to get things to work so that we efficiently produce. Yeah? Um, that is something that our colleagues on the ground are doing. I think also, for example, Achim would be doing this kind of work with his organization where we, we simply, it's simply talking uh, to each other and trying to explain the, what, what is, uh, if there's basically a road problem, uh, similar problems we would have had, for example, in our facility in Hull in the UK, that is normal. Then you sit down with a local council and you try to find, uh, you try to find a way how to work it out. So um, normally uh, the local uh, municipalities are very supportive in these kind of things because they know that it will attract jobs and uh, it's good, it's good for, all, for all involved. So that, that would be my answer to that one. Akeem, did you want to come in in Taiwan? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think this is manageable in the end. You know, it's, I'm not too concerned about this part of it because there will be a solution if there is a need and, and so on. Uh, I think the problems are more in the overall regulations which make it very difficult for us to, to align with the projects and build them in the most speedy and successful way. Any other questions from our audience? Gentlemen at the back there. Um, hi everyone, my name is Nat. Um, I'm working in project control for ENBW. Um, I have several questions. I think the panelists also already tackled the grid infrastructure. Um, I think as we would see the next generation wind farm would be a gigawatt scale. How could we, as an industry, make sure that um, the government are, are ready to build that infrastructure for us to build the wind farm, or as an industry as a whole, to build the next you know, gigawatt wind farm? Who wants to take the grid question first? <laughs> Danielle. I can give it a try. Um, I think it's important to have a view on, uh, holistically on the network, on the grid and, and transmission design. Um, of course, locally, where the point of interconnection is, but also then um, nationally. And, and this is clearly, um, besides uh, the commitment and the goals for, for renewables, um, in a market, another task which needs to be taken up by the state or the regulatory authorities to say, okay, we, we need to think this through. 
how we build a holistic um, grid and trans transmission design. Um, effectively, you can also um, um, think about um, reuse of um, when you have phase out of conventional um, uh, of reuse of existing uh, grid and transmission infrastructure, and this of course needs to come all together and um, is in the hands of the most experienced authority in that respect, mainly the transmission and grid authorities. Thank you. I think we've got, oh, yeah, we've got another question. Thanks, Rico. Hello, uh, my name is Jacopo Landi. I'm a journalist for French media. Uh, actually, I had more of a clarification, just to be sure I understood correctly for, oh, sorry. For the gentleman from Skyborne Radio, at one point you said you don't need feed-in tariffs anymore to develop your projects and that you can manage with PPAs and other types of contract. I wanted to be sure if I understood correctly if it's just for the Taiwanese market and if maybe it's also the case for other developers like RWE. Thanks. Well, for, for my part, uh, if it's a, a, a well-developed market like Germany, for example, we do not need any tariff anymore. We have, for example, our own Gennaker project in coastal waters. There will not be any tender. It's just uh, our own business, how to get the income into the project. And we do fine. You know, that's, uh, we will manage to do so. Um, but if you want to have an entry into a market, a, a new market, then let's say Indonesia. If they really want to make a big uh, industry, offshore wind industry in Indonesia, they should uh, think about a high feed-in tariff for the first round. Thank you. Does just, that clarify? Just to add on this, I think the general headline is to have a prudent and ma uh, reliable market design because we as developers are committed to not only come in for one round, and I think you also didn't mean that, but to stay there for long because we are committed to a market. And a reliable and prudent market design gives that um, investment and investors um, kind of uh, yeah, confidence because we are talking here in investment in supply chain, we are talking investment in projects, etc. So um, one of the largest offshore markets in the world, in particular now in this year of the energy crisis, the UK with the CFDs did quite a good job because you also have the balance of uh, not seeing necessarily the energy price spikes and it's um, a win-win for the developer and, uh, and the government uh, to get to the agenda of renewables build out. So I think there are various models out there. You're fully right, the corporate PPA market is um, uh, rapidly um, increasing and I think we are very welcome, very much welcoming this. And in, under the headline of the climate crisis, it's anyhow a must-have going forward because we need to see the decarbonisation of the industry. Thank you. Marty, did you want to come yes, in on I that? Yes, I also agree with that. You know, the, the government should come together with developers so we can share our experience because you know, looking just in historical values doesn't mean that it may apply to your specific country. Maybe it's, it's a hybrid model that they need to come up with. Perhaps start with a PPA and then you know, turn it into something else later. But the point is um, we are happily willing to share and, and work with, with local governments and local partners. Thank you. I think we've got, one, we've got time for one more question. We got any more? All right. Well, in that case, I'm going to invite each of our panelists to leave us with one takeaway in an area that we didn't get to discuss in our panel session, because I think we could have carried on for ages. So there's so much to talk about. So, Akeem, you've got my eye, so I'm going to come to you first. Well, when we were discussing uh, the grid connection, I think there is a huge potential for for using the, the sea as uh, the area where you put the cables in. Also just as an example, in Sweden, uh, it's also a long country with a long coastline, but there you have to increase the uh, grid capacity uh, from the north to the south, and one easy way would just be to put the cables into the sea, 
can be done much quicker, much easier than to run through a thousand kilometers with all the landowners. Of course, this uh, infrastructure is more vulnerable as we learn these days. Um, but uh, maybe we can, uh, we can have a better look on our stuff uh, and, and protect that. Question? I'll come to you. Oh. Yes. Well, I was thinking <laughs> about what, 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 that's fine. <laughs> I'm thinking what I haven't said. I think what's important for us, um, coming back to the investment part of it, is to have clear rules, having schemes also in Asia Pacific that don't incentivize negative bids from the developers, because that basically goes back to the whole supply chain and puts so much pressure mm. that we will not have the capability to invest if that continues. And I mean, you know, we're in uh, severe financial difficulties. You've seen this in other uh, podium discussions, probably during the trade show. So I think that's something that's very important for us to get to more qualitative evaluations away from this negative bidding, uh, let's call it vicious cycle. Yeah. Eloise? Yes, um, I think I'm just going to hark back to my, one of my earlier points about personnel. I think every graph we see shows that it's going to be a it's a growth market and in perhaps a poorly formed analogy, you know, it's a big cake that we've got at the end. Everyone's building this big cake, but we don't have enough bakers at all. And I think really we've just got to uh, start building the capacity in, in, in these countries. Marty? Yes, <clears throat> I just want to share that it, it's important for, for governments to possibly support uh, developers in, in looking at the projects because for some countries, the development costs are a lot higher than others due to connection costs or transmission costs. So we look for local partners. Um, we, we need to all work together and, and take a look and see how we can get it done. Right? It's probably not impossible, but we need the support from all sides. Thank you. And last but not least, Danielle. Amisha. As I mentioned Groundhog Day, I will at least get back to it and, and, and really to say um, in, in each of the countries we mentioned namely, but overall in Asia, the potential is huge. And we are in the midst of an energy and climate crisis. In this conference, we tend to forget because we are all thinking alike. We are all want to drive wind forward. We all want to drive renewables forward. And Asia has the potential and each one of the markets now needs to, needs to take the lessons learned, uh, be clear on the commitments, have the clear goals, have the strategic transmission and network plans, be clear on port infrastructure, and get the basics right, and have a prudent and reliable market design, and then we are all up for that. With that, thank you very much to our panelists. Can I invite you to join me in thanking our panelists in the usual way? Thank you very much. And thank you to you all for joining us. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, I'm not sure, I think I've seen some of you read um, the GWEC Global Offshore Wind Report. If you, haven't, if you haven't got a copy yet, please visit the GWEC stand. And it's also available to download on their website as well. It's a must read, so please do download that and have a look. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, lovely to meet yeah, you. Thanks, well, nice meeting you. Thank you, lovely to meet you. All right. Lovely to meet you. Yeah.